thank you, uh, Professor Henschel, and your team um, at RCSI for the opportunity uh, to speak uh, tonight. Thank you. Um, the topic of lifestyle is very wide ranging, and um, as Professor Delanti said earlier, um, could spend uh, the evening speaking about any one particular slide, and it's similar with lifestyle, um, but I'll try to do it justice in the time that I have. Um, so the first thing to say really is to explain the, the impact of epilepsy that it can have across um, all the domains in a person's life, um, and this uh, graphic uh, captures it um, in, in many ways. Um, there's the physical aspects of epilepsy, um, the seizures, the safety issues that come with having seizures. Um, there's the economic and cultural aspects um, that affect um, a person in the workplace and beyond the workplace. Um, cognitive um, impacts as well for many people that would um, have an impact on their learning, um, memory and concentration. Um, those would, would be commonly reported effects. Um, psychological impacts um, in terms of anxiety, living with a, a condition where there's a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability and the anxiety that that can, can bring about day-to-day -day life, going out and about and planning issues and so on. And that can, again, have an effect on, on mood and increase stress for the person with epilepsy. So that's, that's a big component um, for many people of living with epilepsy. And also there's the social aspect, um, the opportunities that the person with epilepsy would have um, to have the same um, social uh, interaction and um, also to tap into support networks um, in their communities and so on. Um, and trying to um, identify those and trying to enhance those um, is part of some of the programmes that we do at Epilepsy Ireland that I'll be um, discussing later in the presentation. Um, in terms of seizures, um, from a lifestyle perspective, there can be triggers to those seizures. The triggers aren't causes of epilepsy, but they would um, heighten the likelihood of a seizure happening for an individual. Um, some seizures are more readily avoidable, others are not avoidable. So um, on, your, on your right there, you have a list of um, those seizures that would be perhaps um, more easy to avoid. Um, missed medication, <coughs> stress and anxiety, lack of sleep, um, alcohol, energy drinks um, with high levels of caffeine in them tend to be uh, triggers for seizures, street drugs perhaps. Um, but on the other side, you would have a list of more physical triggers that somebody can't necessarily avoid, um, illness, um, periods, hormonal uh, components to the to, um, seizure triggers, fever, um, heightened um, temperature can trigger seizures. A pain for some people or extremes of heat and cold. Flashing lights, it's commonly assumed that flashing lights affect everybody with epilepsy, but in actual fact, it affects only 3 to 5 percent of people with epilepsy. Um, the majority of people wouldn't be affected, and this is something that's detected on the EEG when the person is initially being diagnosed, but it's a very important piece of information for the person to have, and if there's any doubt, somebody needs to check with their medical team whether or not they have photosensitivity and whether that would affect them being exposed to flashing lights or, or strobes, for instance. So as you can see, there are lots of triggers, and indeed that's not by any means a comprehensive list. If you asked 100 people with epilepsy what their individual triggers would be, you would add many more to that. Um, but they are individual, and it's important to try and identify them. So what is a healthy lifestyle? Well, I think if I was to ask around the room, would probably come up with a list similar to this. Um, people would say healthy regular meals, uh, not skipping meals, regular sleep pattern, um, managing stress, taking exercise, treating illness early. All of this is extremely important for somebody with epilepsy as well. Um, and just to say a little about each of these, um, in relation to nutrition, really I suppose the main thing to say is if somebody can have healthy, balanced meals and a varied diet and get the nutrients that they need um, from their diet in that way. I mentioned already about the energy drinks um, with the high caffeine content that can trigger seizures. 
Um, if somebody's using over-the-counter nutritional supplements, it's important to check um, with their medical team or with their pharmacist whether there be any interaction effects um, with those um, supplements. Um, prescribed diets like the ketogenic diet, they play a limited role um, in the management of epilepsy, but the, it is receiving um, more recent interest and a resurgence of interest. It's something that's been known about for quite some time, but um, there's more interest in it um, at the moment, and perhaps we'll see more about that in time to come, but it will still um, perhaps have a limited role for certain groups of people um, that might be identified as being suitable for that approach. Um, in respect of exercise, it's something everybody needs. Um, keeps us fit and healthy, relieves stress. Um, we'd advocate gentle, regular exercise. Um, important to know your fitness levels and not to overtrain or overstrain, to keep hydrated and just take sensible precautions, really. In relation to sports and epilepsy, and we get a lot of queries um, in regard to this, and I'm sure Professor Delante um, does as well with regard to assessing um, people for various sports. We'd firstly say everybody's different, um, and to look at the approach of trying to, um, insofar as possible, aim to include the person in the sport rather than finding ways of excluding them. But seizure control is an important factor in assessing safety. Um, and medical opinions advised for high-risk sports. Um, most people with epilepsy can take part in most track-based sports. Typically, um, they can play football. Um, court sports like tennis, volleyball, basketball, as a rule, um, are considered to be uh, lower risk. Um, but there is caution to be advised with um, contact sports like rugby, hurling, anywhere where there might be blows to the head involved and it would be important for protective headgear um, to be worn and a medical opinion would be um, advisable in those uh, cases of those sports. Um, boxing involves repeated blows to the head area and so there's particular concern in relation to that. Um, other maybe more extreme sports like hang gliding and so on would be high risk sports and um, sports where there's a, a, a difficulty with effecting a rescue. Um, we really need to assess that very carefully. Um, the likes of mon mountain climbing or potholing, um, that would require a very careful assessment. Um, and the degree of seizure freedom is, is really the, the, uh, the main factor um, in, in assessing that. With regard to swimming, um, swimming is possible um, even where seizures are ongoing, provided that the person is swimming in a pool and not in open current. Um, and that they have a support person with them or that there's a lifeguard on hand that can tend to the seizure and knows what to do um, in respect of a seizure in the water. And we would recommend that somebody with active seizures who's going swimming in a pool would wear a brightly coloured swim cap so that they can be very promptly identified if they were to disappear below the surface. Um, that's critical. Um, in terms of... Um, careers and career options. There are a few jobs that aren't open to people with epilepsy, but seizure type and seizure control are important factors as well. Um, the exceptions would be in relation to, um, as I say, there aren't many blanket bans, but um, somebody with a history of epilepsy would not be allowed to become a pilot or join the defence forces, become a bus driver or a train driver. Um, but they might be permitted to drive um, a heavy goods vehicle if they're 10 years seizure free and off medication. If someone has active seizures, um, there could be barriers um, in the workplace in respect of any uh, jobs, driving roles and uh, work with heavy machinery, sharp tools, hazardous chemicals, supervising children or vulnerable people. It all comes down to an individualised assessment um, and uh, medical opinion as well. Uh, to support somebody with epilepsy in the workplace, um, and if people have any concerns about discriminatory practices in the workplace, there is employment equality legislation, and Epilepsy Ireland um, will advise somebody in relation to any concerns they have um, in regard to any issues that arise in the workplace of potential discrimination practices. Um, there's also um, a requirement on employers to make reasonable accommodations um, to support an employee with a disability. 
and there may be adaptation grants available um, to put measures in place to support that person, depending on what might be required in the setting. So there's more information available on that uh, from Epilepsy Ireland. And just to say that for anybody who is um, perhaps looking at having to reevaluate their career um, or looking um, at, at future training options but not sure um, of a direction to take, Epilepsy Ireland runs a one-year full-time training programme in the Institute of Technology in Sligo. Um, and it's a, f it's a funded programme, um, there's no fees and the person is entitled to retain any um, benefits that they might be in receipt of uh, while they're on the programme. And the name of the programme is Training for Success. Again, there's more information about this on our website. Um, in relation to travel, um, you've already heard about the driving regulations as they apply in Ireland. Uh, when somebody um, with epilepsy is travelling abroad and looking at driving, well the driving guidance varies um, depending on where they might be going. Within Europe, um, it's a standard 12 month seizure freedom uh, within the EU um, countries um, as a result of the EU directive on, on driving. But outside of the EU, it varies from country to country. And in fact, even in the US, it will vary from state to state. So it's very important to find out uh, in advance um, what, what's going to apply in, in the area that you're going to and whether you're going to meet um, the requirements. Um, also, there need perhaps to be some thought given to if it's a passenger with epilepsy, managing seizures in, in certain situations, um, managing a seizure in a car, on a bus, on a plane, all of these aspects, we can supply information and um, explain to somebody what needs to be done in those uh, situations. Um, but it's important to plan ahead and, and think about these eventualities. Hopefully they won't arise, but in the event that they do, preparation is key. If somebody's going on holidays, it's very important within Europe that they would have their EHIC card. You might remember the E111 form. Um, this is what, the, what it's known as now, the EHIC card. The way that works is that the EHIC um, scheme entitles you to the um, full cover that a public patient in that country would have. Now that does not necessarily equate to 100% of the cost. So for instance in France it might be 80% and you will be um, liable for the 20% um, the in that situation. So it's also important to have your travel insurance as well and not be solely reliant on the EHIC card because um, what's covered in the public system around Europe can vary from country to country and not all, con not all countries will cover 100% of the cost. So we would say have your EHIC card and have your travel insurance as well just in case there's any shortfall. And also to find out in advance before you go what the local services are in the area that you might be staying um, just in case you have need to access any of them. In relation to travel, the triggers that might arise um, in, in um, holiday situations would be intense heat or intense cold, um, maybe glare factors, um, time zone changes if somebody's going on a long haul trip that can have, have impacts like a change of pattern uh, of meals or sleep or taking tablets. All of these things need to be considered in advance and just to have a plan around how that's going to be managed. Um, we'd advise carrying your medication in your hand luggage, not to put it in your checked-in baggage, because we've all known that baggage can go in a different direction to where, you, where it's intended, so it's important to, to have it with you. Have a copy of your script, but keep that separate of the medication in case the um, prescription needs to be uh, rewritten uh, um, when you're away um, for any reason, if the medication is lost or damaged in any way. Um, Doctor, or doctors um, in this country, when they pr write a prescription, that prescription wouldn't be valid outside the country, and it's like it's the same um, when a, when a visitor comes here with a foreign prescription, um, the medication can't be dispensed on a foreign prescription, but it can be rewritten by a doctor registered in that country. Um, with re in respect of travel vaccines, just the recommendation is speak to the doctor, speak to your medical team about what you might require if you're going to an area where vaccination is recommended. Um, just in terms of broader issues around relaxation and stress management, and this is a, a, a very common um, 
query that we get um, at Epilepsy Ireland really would suggest choosing an enjoyable activity, um, something you know, that you know that you'll um, look forward to doing and make the time for. It might take practice um, to actually get to the point of um, getting into it and, and making it part of your day-to-day your -day routine. It doesn't really matter so much what it is as the fact that, that you enjoy doing it and, and benefit from it, but the kinds of things that people tell us that they've enjoyed and benefited from would be yoga, meditation, mindfulness, um, is something that's coming up a great deal at the moment. Um, and people seem to um, find that very beneficial. Um, other people would mention that they'd like to go walking or do some art or maybe some reading. So it's, it's individual, but it's important to find something that um, will help you to actually um, manage your, your stress and uh, to get to a point of relaxation. And just in terms of when you're applying this at home, um, to utilise, you can utilise classes or books or videos. Um, there's lots of online tutorials as well. But um, just to apply it at home, to create a relaxing environment, choosing a quiet time, reducing noise levels, turn off the TV, the radio, the phone, um, reduce um, lighting levels as well, just for a subdued um, effect, maybe have a light snack and uh, keep the temperature even um, in the room where you are and wear loose clothing if you're going to do any kind of physical um, movement exercises or maybe listen to soothing music um, or a guided relaxation. It's all very common sense in, in a way, but it's just important to, again, emphasise that this actually you know, is, is quite beneficial um, for people with epilepsy. Um, just to say a word about sleep and the relationship between sleep and seizure as well. The function of sleep is really you know, uh, in relation to rest and repair and the body um, replenishing itself after its day's work and um, you're probably familiar with the concept of the body clock but when, um, when we go for instance if you went an hour a night um, over a week um, without if you reduced your sleep time by about an hour a night over a week you would owe yourself about seven hours um, at the end of the week so that's what we call a sleep debt so that can accumulate over time, as you can imagine. And so all of these things and pattern changes like that can have an impact. Um, and so sleep is, a, is an important um, function and it's important in epilepsy because tiredness can, again, act as um, a, sleep, uh, a trigger where there's sleep deprivation. There's also safety issues where there's seizures in sleep with regard to um, detection of seizures and there was mentioned earlier of alarms and detection equipment and certainly we'd get a lot of queries with regard to um, equipment for detecting seizures in sleep because that would be a concern people would have if a seizure were to occur and they weren't aware that, um, that the person was having a seizure and how would, how would that be alerted to. So there are, um, for instance, alarms that can be um, put in under the mattress to detect motion um, and to detect other features of seizures and they can alert a carer in the home or there are other camera-based devices that will um, also act as motion detectors that will alert uh, as well. So sometimes people like to use uh, a combination of alarms but there's a range of them available. If you're having sleep difficulties, uh, sleep is a problem in your life, um, it's important to speak to your doctor about that and discuss what, what options there might be to try and establish uh, a good sleep pattern again. There are some tips on our website um, about getting a good night's rest, just to reinforce everything that I've been saying um, with regard to sleep and relaxation. Um, just to take the safety point a little further, um, it's one of the things we do in our programmes is around safety planning and um, really I suppose the main focus of planning around safety and it's, it's individual for everybody but within the context of the home we'd recommend showers over baths um, for the obvious reasons that um, there can be difficulties with regard to somebody being in, in water unsupervised and having a seizure in that context and showers um, are preferable from that point of view, maybe with a shower chair being used. Also, you know, looking at cooking and how that might be carried out if somebody's having very frequent seizures, they may need to review the safety around um, the kinds of appliances they're using and so on. Similarly, with open fires, um, there might need to be 
um, a review of the safety around uh, those and the, in regard to um, sleep and with um, bedding and with um, pillows that we provide free of charge for people with epilepsy that would um, have ventilated, they would be ventilated, they would have holes in them like a, a child's cot mattress and so the rationale for that is that um, to allow air circulate. So again, um, the other thing I would say in relation to sleep seizures is that um, top bunks are inadvisable for anybody who might be having uh, sleep seizures and that might sound like a very obvious point to make but it has happened that people have fallen from top bunks um, during seizures and sustained nasty injuries. Um, with regard to leisure uh, activities we get queries about cinema and concerts and I guess if somebody has um, photosensitive epilepsy in particular they may have particular concerns about going into those environments. Sometimes it might be um, the case that there is a warning attached to a, a movie or um, to an event but often um, it might just be the case that the person has this concern about being in that environment and whether they might be exposed to um, flashing lights. Um, there is a requirement um, to actually place a warning um, if that's likely to happen. However, you can't always control for live events and particularly the likes of fireworks and so on are unpredictable. Um, if, if somebody is in that situation and they do have photosensitive epilepsy, one of the key things that they can do um, at the time is to just place one hand over one eye like that and try to get themselves out of the situation. That's one of the, the ways that's recommended in order to try and uh, reduce um, their exposure. Um, with regard to travel, again, I've emphasised uh, the planning of journeys and um, there's also issues to do with safety in the school and the workplace and we get a lot of queries every September when people are making their choices maybe for a school as regards what subjects they might be looking at taking, particularly at secondary. Um, if there's active ongoing seizures there might be queries regarding taking technical or practical subjects and again it all comes down to individualised assessment and our view would very much be to try and support the child um, to do whatever subject it is that they have an interest in doing by supporting them, for instance, with having an SNA on hand rather than um, taking the view that it's not suitable for them to do that particular subject. And similarly in the workplace where, where that can be done with reasonable accommodations. Safety planning is also important to reduce the risk of injuries and uh, SUDEP, which is sudden death and epilepsy, which you, you heard about previously. Um, and this is where the role of the alarms and pillows and also there's ID bracelets for when people are out and about and they uh, might have a seizure unaccompanied, say if they're down, down at the shops, somebody might come across them and it's not clear what might be happening. Well, an ID bracelet can... Um, give the information um, that's required to uh, passerby uh, or to the um, emergency services um, to state that this person has epilepsy and their contact details and their, uh, their medication and who is their, their treating consultant and so on. We get a lot of queries about dogs in relation to epilepsy and seizure dogs and seizure alert dogs and support dogs and um, what I can say at the moment is that while there's nobody training um, these dogs in the Republic, um, to our knowledge, um, there is um, a trainer in Northern Ireland who can train the family pet. The dog is not provided, but um, the family pet can be uh, trained um, by this service. So, um, okay. So we just emphasise that it's important to try and find a balance um, between seizure prevention and the freedom to just enjoy um, life and undue restrictions uh, would negatively affect a person's quality of life. And finding a balance, well, how do you do that? Well, you say, well, be well informed, um, have a positive approach, aim for a balance between underprotection and overprotection. Um, try not to focus just on obstacles. Try to find a way around them be realistic but be flexible. And just to say for the last um, two slides I just really want to explain about our programmes that are targeted for people who are newly diagnosed or families um, 
of people who are newly diagnosed or parents of people who are newly diagnosed. Um, the first one is the toolkit program, the Living Well with Epilepsy program. And essentially what this covers in is a three hour session of covering all the different aspects of epilepsy that somebody might have questions about when they come to it new. Um, it contains seizure management charts, a medication management section, first aid information, seizure diary, medical team section, safety action planning that I've already mentioned to you would be covered in, in detail within this, the information checklist on epilepsy, um, a resources list, an appointments planner, details of all our services. We have 10 offices around the country offering all these programs um, on an ongoing basis. There's also a 40 page information booklet um, on all the frequently asked questions about epilepsy, such as healthy lifestyle, daily life, safety, and information for parents. Um, it contains a wallet and ID card, and also a first aid uh, poster that somebody can um, take to, say, their school or place of work um, and to have it displayed there. And finally, um, as, a, as a next level to the toolkit um, sessions, we run um, self-management programs around the country. These last, um, for adults, these are six weeks programs. Um, all our programs are free of charge. Um, and essentially what it is, is a support program to become your own epilepsy expert. Uh, it's an opportunity to meet others and to share experiences. It deals with topics like epilepsy management, um, social interaction and dealing with social situations when you have epilepsy because that can be something very difficult um, for the person with epilepsy and they might try to avoid those situations. So we try and explore that and try and find strategies um, to support the person to, to actually um, expand their um, social network and social interaction. Uh, it involves peer learning. Um, confidence building, broader life management, increased quality of life. Um, the module topics would be self-management and becoming an effective self-manager, living with epilepsy, managing your epilepsy care, managing safety and lifestyle um, and seizure triggers, support and communication, stress management, diet, sleep and exercise, managing thoughts, managing feelings and planning for the future. So you can see it's very comprehensive. Um, but we have run several hundred of these at this stage around the country since 2014 and the feedback from them has been really um, tremendous. Um, so we're very, very encouraged by that. It seems to be um, providing what people need um, in relation to um, the self-management aspect um, of their epilepsy. And so another uh, dimension to that is that within a group as well, um, there's a great deal of support that can happen um, among people with epilepsy to one another and it might be the first time that those people with epilepsy have ever been um, in the company of other people with epilepsy and that alone um, is an invaluable experience um, for the people who come onto the, onto the programme. So that's, uh, that's our services and um, that's an overview of lifestyle issues and I just want to say thank you all for your attention and thanks again to Orson Sound for the opportunity.